this morning, I'll try to give a brief talk on the forest cover dynamics in Indonesia over the past two decades and their policies um, consequences. This is actually part of the work that have been done for the last one year. We have a collaboration with um, Directorate Forestry Planning under the Ministry of Forestry. And <clears throat> we just recently finished this collaboration um, last year. So um, <clears throat> and I'm going to um, start um, to talk with the introduction. So um, as many developing countries see actually, um, deforestation is uh, necessary and it's actually a common trade-off for development also to uh, support the economic um, growth and also to improve uh, livelihood and uh, alleviate the poverty. As a consequence, um, deforestation contribute to 6 to 17 percent of um, global um, emissions, of um, total global emissions worldwide. And Indonesia, as home for the third largest tropical countries, is also um, suffering um, similar um, occurrence or events. However, we argue if forest clearing in Indonesia is effective and is directed to support development in a way that forests can sustain in the future. Um, and this is actually important because um, based on um, recent national communication report um, submitted to UNFCCC, 85% of uh, total greenhouse gases emissions in, in Indonesia actually um, comes from land use, land use chains and forestry sectors. 55% of those actually from deforestation and the remaining more than 50%, 40% actually from pit um, fires and pit oxidation because of the pit drainage. We use the data um, generated by Ministry of Forestry. We work together to um, do an exercise trying to estimate um, forest carbon emissions um, projections in the future for FRL um, or forest reference emissions level for, um, um, as an exercise. So um, we use the data, uh, land use data from 1990, 2000, 2003, 2006, 2009, and 2012, which was actually refined and improved by Ministry of Forestry and checked for consistency and reliability. Um, and this is actually interesting because the data has not only um, forest and non-forest information, but also information on different land use that includes um, primary forest, secondary forest, they also um, differentiate between mangrove forest, upland forest, pit swamp forest, rice cultivation, um, estate crops, um, crops, garden, and, and so on. So we could actually classify those classes into um, several subclasses to identify key drivers of deforestation and also to, to actually um, analyze what is actually um, the post-forest land use and to identify the proximate causes um, causing forest clearing in Indonesia. Forest is actually defined as a land spanning more than 0 0.25 hectares with a tree higher than five meters and the canopy cover of more than 30%. So <clears throat> the first finding was we found forest stock in 1990 was about 113 million hectares and it decreased um, substantially in 2012, where um, we found only uh, 92 million hectares of forest remain, which means that um, across 22 years, Indonesia lost of about 21 million hectares of forest. Deforestation trend, however, decreased um, in the first decade, which is from 1990 to 2000, deforestation, deforestation rate was about 1.2 million hectares per year, and in the recent decade, from 2000 to 2012, deforestation rate was actually uh, around 0 0.7 million hectares per year. <clears throat> However, in the last three years of our study, from 2009 to 2012, the trend of deforestation increased, and it reached to 650,000 uh, hectares of forest loss in, in the final year, in 2012, which is actually higher than deforestation in, Bra uh, in Brazilian Amazon. We also found that Forest degradation is a major precursor for deforestation. Over the study period, we found the extent of uh, primary upland forest decreased from 52 million hectares to 40 million hectares across 22 years period. At the same time, the um, extent of degraded upland forest or secondary upland forest remains relatively unchanged, which was around um, 37 million hectares. However, but we found also that deforestation from 
degraded forests actually contribute to more than 55% of total deforestation and only less than 5% deforestation came from uh, primary forests. So this actually confirmed um, other studies that um, <clears throat> once forests actually open, it has more access, easy access, it's actually easier to, to, um, to convert to other land uses. And what happens actually after deforestation? And this is actually very interesting. Um, we found 12 million hectares of forest loss between 1990 to 2000. 40% of this, which is around 5.8 million hectares, were actually converted to shrubs or open land. And these two um, land use can be actually um, considered as non-productive because um, there is no actually um, real um, economic activities or this land use actually has no real uh, um, economic benefits compared to other uh, land use, uh, for example, um, agriculture, um, estate crops, rice cultivations, uh, timber plantations, and others. And only 1.8 million hectares of forests were cleared and converted to subsistence agriculture, while uh, 1.7 million hectares of forests actually used for the expansions of estate crops, mainly uh, oil palm and sometimes mixed with rubber. Um, and this trend actually continues between 2000 and 2012 of about 8.7 million hectares of forest actually lost and 52% or 4.5 million hectares of forest actually converted to shrub and plus 1.4 million hectares of forest actually uh, cleared and converted to open land. This is very interesting and fascinating since um, <clears throat> the general perspective sees that deforestation is a fuel for development. Then it comes to our argument, does deforestation in Indonesia actually lead to more shrubs or it creates more jobs? Um, and when we analyze the, um, this unproductive land use, the shrubs and open land development across, um, across the two decades, we found that um, there was a substantially increase in shrub lands and, up, uh, and open lands from 22 million hectares in 1990 to 27 million hectares of, uh, in, in 2012. And we also follow the trajectory of shrublands across the 22 years period. Between 1990 and 2000, there were 6.2 million hectares of shrubs actually um, con converted from forest land. And in 2012, 5.1 million hectares of those shrubs or open land remains as the same land categories which means that only 1.1 million hectares of forest converted to shrublands and used in 2012. So the rest of it, there remains as shrubs. Um, in general, we found that um, clear forest remains as unproductive for about 13.4 years at national scale. However, in Sumatra, and Kalimantan in Sumatra where the needs of uh, lands are more, is more pressing, the um, unproductive lands is normally, they, they are actually for 11.4 years, and in Kalimantan is actually 12.8 years. The, remain, um, the land remains unproductive. And what about actually the consequences to the emissions? We did a um, more detailed analysis for the to, um, to peatlands converted to shrubs, and we found that from 1990 to 2012, there were 12 million hectares of forest loss, and it's converted to shrublands, and that includes actually the conversion of 5.1 million hectares of uh, forest of peat forest to shrubs. And when we calculated, we estimated the emissions out of it from the uh, from the ab above ground um, carbon loss of about 7.4 gigaton of CO2 equivalent were actually released to the atmosphere. And as an addition, 2.5 gigaton of CO2 actually um, released to the atmosphere from the um, oxidation of, of peat soil, from, from the peat soil. So in total, actually, when we compare with other study published in, in PNES, the emissions from peatlands converted to shrubs from 1990 to 2000 and, uh, from 1990 to 2010 actually contribute to 57% of total emissions from deforestation and peatland degradations nationally. And it's pretty huge actually. So uh, based on our findings, 
we um, set up some or we have some recommendations r related to the policies. Um, first, it's actually useful actually to intensify the use of unproductive land, such as those um, abandoned uh, absentee land, which was actually classified as shrubs or open land. Um, and this actually could um, save 10 million, over 10 million hectares of forest land, which was allocated under convertible forests. And then it, was, it can be replaced by such um, um, abandoned land. The second is that the proper evaluations on the planning of forest land allocation zone. Our study also found that um, 36 million hectares of production or limited production forests were actually allocated in 2012. But and in the, within this area, actually, forest clearing is, is, very, is very limited. But we found um, nearly half of forest loss between 2000 and 2012 actually occurred in the production or limited production forest zones. So the proper evaluation of uh, forest planning um, <clears throat> should be also conducted. And it's also useful, um, as suggested by several other studies, to extend the coverage of forest moratorium, not only to include primary forest and peatland, but also to um, include um, secondary forest, which is still high in biodiversity and has um, relatively high carbon stocks. Um, and this actually could simply um, save um, more than 34 million hectares of degraded um, forest in 2012, which was actually degrade, annually degraded from 1990 to 2012 at, um, at the rate of 0 0.8 million hectares per year. And the last recommendation would be um, it's also useful to, to consider the options of zero deforestation policies for further expansions of oil palm plantation and, and pulp and paper plantations. So I guess that's my, my talk. Thank you. And I guess it's time for Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Arif. That was very, very informative. Um, do, do we have some questions? Christoph. <coughs> Uh, excellent presentation. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, things to think about and a lot of questions to ask. Um, maybe I'll try three. Uh, uh, first, when you talk about uh, when you talk about these shrub 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 lands, basically we are talking about degraded land or de land that's been sort of a you know a degraded sort of deforested land, savanna style. I'm just trying to make sure that I understand the, the, the definition of the concept. Um, so just a clarification on that. The, you know, I, I really, I'm looking forward to the, I, I assume that you will probably publish something based on this, so I look forward to a, to a paper published so that we can read and sort of uh, learn more. But, I, you know, we all have kind of a basic understanding that in Indonesia over time, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of land has been allocated to various concessions, a lot of land has been cleared, not much land has been, or much less land has been planted, you know, which, which you show in your analysis that, uh, you know, so many hectares, millions of hectares have been, you know, cleared and, and so on. My, my question is, do we know more about why? I mean, we, we kind of know that, okay, millions of hectares have been deforested, only a little bit has been planted, whether for oil palm or for anything else, and, and everything else has been kind of idle for, for, for decades. I think I think the, the question why, like why, 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 is uh, is uh, is something that's itching. Uh, and the final uh, final question you mentioned about the emissions that uh, it's generally assumed that something like six to seven percent at the beginning of your presentation. It's seven to twelve percent. Seven to twelve originates from land. From deforestation. Globally. It is globally. Just globally. I, I I just saw something. I think it was came from Lou or somebody else uh, last week that. Uh, there are some new estimates indicating that perhaps up to 40% or whatever of global emissions can be coming from land use. So I just, maybe somebody else can comment on this, I don't know. Uh, not necessarily to you, but uh, these figures are quite, you know, okay. kind of changing, so. Okay. Good. Um, thanks, Christoph, for the questions. Very interesting. So um, what we actually identified as shrubs here is um, is a more of the mix between like savanna, grassland. It could be like uh, from, from one meters to, to even more, like two meters on, or so in high. But it's, it's still, uh, it, 
in, in, in many cases also mixed with like sparse trees, like a group of, group of sparse trees. So, um, and the, the expert from Ministry of Forestry, they actually identified this. They're still, I mean, they don't find like a regular pages if, as if, uh, if someone find um, timber plantations or, or any, any concessions where, where you have like regular patches. So it's more like irregular patches and then the, the, from the satellite data you can also see that this is not as rough as trees. So then it was actually identified as shrubs. So this is the first thing. And yes, we are now still working in the, in the paper, in the manuscript for journal. Now it's, um, um, it's under re internal review, so it's still with other co-authors. But sure, um, we will publish that, thank you. And why idle? Actually, um, to be honest, I have some speculations on it. Although actually, I don't know, I mean, it still need to be proven um, um, to, to provide some more scientific evidence. One is actually um, because of um, quite a number of companies, we actually overlay those shrublands with the map of concessions and map of HPH, so timber um, logging concessions, also HTE, or timber plantations, and quite a number of, of those shrubs are actually within those concessions. Uh, first thing that come up into my mind is, it, I guess it's a practice of land banking of this concession, that they actually, they want to keep the concession active, they, they took all the timbers, but then they actually, they don't really have an uh, intention to, to convert those areas into uh, more productive land. But they keep the, uh, the, the license active because every two years it's still um, reported to Ministry of Forestry um, and it's actually still an active concession, but no actually an active um, activist. But this is one thing. And um, the second is that it's also specul speculations. Um, what I discuss with the people from Ministry of Environment, many of, um, uh, of those degraded lands once it was degraded and converted to shrubs, the local people came in and claimed the land. And it creates actually more conflicts at the local level. And um, the global land use um, would have, thank you. And um, in my understanding, the last report, the fifth assessment of IPCC report actually uh, estimated 11% of um, total emissions coming from um, Lulusia, from land use and use in forestry. I mean, I hope um, my answer is correct. From deforestation, yeah, eleven percent. So, thanks. Uh, Louis, I guess um, first. Or oh, Louis. Yeah, Louis. yeah the, the use of the term shrubs also is the first thing that stuck at, stuck out for me, and I just wanted to ask if um, and it, forgive me if you already mentioned it, but how much land classified as shrubs um, returned to forest through natural succession? Uh, during, you know, during the time period that you were looking at, if you have that, and uh, if, um, if, if it's not looked at that way, then um, one would, you know, there are definitely costs to conversion of shrubland to what you might call other productive uses such as oil palm, et cetera, in terms of biodiversity. And there is pres presumably, at least in some kinds of land that are, um, uh, classified as shrub land, a potential future of a kind of uh, of a rich secondary forest. So I'm curious to know if those things are, have been taken into account, if not in this study, but in others that you've looked at, and if there's potential to learn a lot more about it. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Louis. So um, I don't have the number in my mind, but um, we esti um, we estimated of about it's only 1.9% of um, areas deforested between 1990 to 2012, and it actually um, grows back as forest in 2012. So it's, it's very subtle actually. So um, I could actually say that it's very unlikely once forest actually cleared, converted to any other land use, including to shrubs it's very unlikely these areas across 22 years period over our study period it will grow back as forest. And it's also the same case for degraded forest. Once it was degraded in the secondary forest state, it's also very unlikely it will grow back as primary forest. 
because many of those degraded forests actually then deforested. I hope it's uh, answer your questions. Danny. Uh, okay, thank you, Arif. It's really a nice talk, uh, especially when we talk about the deforestation in Indonesia. Uh, I'm sure that you might be aware about the deforestation rate published by uh, Belinda Margonos et al., yeah. as well as the Forest Watch Indonesia. I mean, yeah. we got a different, uh, various number of uh, deforestation rate. Yeah. It will be interesting to know, I mean, to explore further scientifically, you know, what, what are the differences and then uh, what is your argument with your, with your rates that you uh, just mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we compared the data, um, the Ministry of Forestry data, with um, the one from Belinda Margono, published in Nature Climate Change last year. And actually, um, Belinda's data shows um, lower deforestation as the Ministry of Forestry data. Um, so um, I, I cannot pick up the number, but um, the Belinda's data in, in her paper also mentioned that the data that is produced by her from her study is actually compared with the Ministry of Forestry data, and it has over 90% of agreement with, with the Ministry of Forestry data. Um, but this is actually 90% of agreement from forest cover in year 2000, but not in the deforest annual deforestation uh, among those two data sets. But I could tell you that it's actually comparable with, with, with the data published by, by Belinda previously. Compared to Hansen's data, um, it has a different definitions because Hansen's data include um, um, tree loss from uh, plantations as a forest cover loss. So it has actually in inflated estimate, I mean, the, the Hansen data. So it's not comparable because um, both data set, the Ministry of Forestry and Hansen's data, they have uh, different forest definitions. Thank you. Other questions? Christine? I'd like to go back to the question that Louis asked, because that was, that was sort of my question, but it was a little bit of a twist. Um, I, I, I was wondering, having spent you know, many years of my life watching um, Sweden's or shifting cultivation fields grow back into secondary forest, the fact that you essentially say that the regrowth rate is sort of negligible for Indonesia. And I'm just wondering, is it, is it I mean, part, part of it may just be the classification, what I think is a secondary forest, you know, you classify as shrubs. But um, also, I wonder whether there's an issue of size, you know, that there are small plots, um, the kinds of, the kinds of places that sort of characterize Ladang that are continuously sort of going back into something that resembles secondary forest. But what you're looking for and what you're seeing are large areas. I mean, I wonder if there's actually a, if there's a principle here of some kind, you know, that sort of small deforestation areas do tend to go back to, I mean, not to primary forest. I mean, the very thought of calling it primary forest means that nothing gets back to being a primary forest, right? But that goes back to being some classification of forest. But um, what you're looking at largely is our larger areas that would not be, that, you know, that, that would not appear as in, in your images. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Christine. That could be true. The thing is that the Ministry of Forestry data, they they actually use this um, Landsat data, which has um, 30 meter resolution of, of spatial. So one pixel actually has a size of 30 meter, which means that it's a, it, it covers 900 square meters on the ground. However, in the in the in the in the interpretation process to to I mean to, to interpret those satellite data into land use map, the minimum permitting unit, which means that the smallest size of the polygons is 6.25 hectares. And this small um, or shifting ag agriculture, a small scale which has a size less than 6.25 hectares could be, I mean, neglected and, I mean, excluded from, 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 from the, or I mean, let's say reforestation at very small scale could be also excluded because of the size of this minimum size of 6.25 hectares. So yes, you're right. It could be one, one thing. That could be one, type of error which could come up from this, this data. Other questions? Nia. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, I'd just like to add a comment because um, Arif and I have been working together on this uh, shrubs and jobs um, paper. And I think the motivation for us is just to raise awareness that one, deforestation can lead to a lot of shrubs. And these are the categories that people don't actively manage um, and also don't figure as productive. So the question can be, are these things productive? What is going on in here? So the questions of Christoph need to be further analyzed, but not based on our data, because our data is just to, to make that point. Um, and the second thing is that these shrubs are not temporary. So a lot of the times the assumption is nature will take its course and then it will just you know come back. But we have waited and waited for so long and it doesn't grow back. So something has to be done and these has to be better managed in Indonesia. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you, Neil. Do I get to ask mine? OK, I'd, I'd like to ask you about this, this zero deforestation that, that you touched on at the, at the, at the tail end. You, you showed that a lot of this degraded land is in peatlands. So if companies are going to stop deforesting and actually go to areas where there's, there's land available, it's often in peatlands. What does this mean for the emissions reductions potential of these zero deforestation pledges if instead of chopping down the, the forest, they're actually going to go to these peatlands and drain them and, and, and put them into, turn them into productive uh, areas? Um, as we estimated, actually, um, so um, the conversions of uh, peat forests um, to shrubs um, from the loss of the carbon stocks uh, above ground, it will emit actually the, the it will loss um, instantly the, the, the stocks of carbon which, which is equal to 7.4 gigaton of CO2. Um, um, it, this, this we estimate actually for, for uh, 20 years from 1990 to 2010. And then plus the emissions from pit itself is around 2.5 gigaton. CO2 equivalent. So it means that in total it's like around 9.9, 10, 10 um, gigaton of CO2 equivalent mm -hmm. of, uh, of a carbon loss when actually uh, pit forest convert to shrublands and it's actually the estimate for, for 20, 20 years. Period. So um, the, and the, the loss of degraded, or the loss of pit swarm is also st staggering. So uh, what would I, would, we, would I recommend to, to have a zero deforestation policies for further expansion of oil palm and, um, and pulp and paper plantation could actually ease the, um, the emissions from, from, from this um, conversion, from land conversions. Yeah. By, by getting them out of, out of the peatlands, you Ex mean? Exactly. Okay. Chris? So if, if you turn this around, you say uh, there's, uh, I forgot the numbers, but there's a huge amount of, of areas that, that are under secondary growth, unproductive. So if you turn this around, then you could say, well, let's then put the oil palm on those lands because it will add biomass to those lands, it will add product, product, uh, productivity to those lands. Is that a bit dangerous or is that a, <laughs> a valid oh, proposition? Oh, yeah. To cultivate um, oil palm on the degraded peatland. Well, on the degraded land, not on not peatland maybe, but uh, on the on, on the degraded, degraded non-peatland, which there is also. Right? Well, actually, that's a that's one of the of the one suggestion that that I I proposed from the study that um, to use more this degraded land um, to 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 have more productive land use, such as um, oil palm plantation, for example, because at the same time, um, Ministry of Forestry has allocated 30 million hectares of convertible forest. And 10 million hectares out of these 30 million hectares actually still in the forest state. I mean, in, in this, I mean, they are still forested landscapes. So why don't just use um, these degraded lands, which was around 27 million hectares in 2012, to replace those 10 percent of forest landscape within the convertible uh, forest land? So yes. Dayu. Dayu. Um, many thanks, Ari, for a very informative presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, um, a lot of the arguments that have been conveyed by uh, government and also by the private sector is actually not being able to identify large swathes of, of um, unproductive lands. In your study, are there large swathes of, of unproductive lands or are they fragmented across the, the forest? 
um, because that's, that's key to them, um, according to their argument, is you need to have large, you know, large trees within an area to, able, to be able to uh, use them, to be able to develop these lands. So, yeah, it's not just the location, but it's the, you know, one place, big, big ones. That's why they're converting, you know, the 30 million, the convertible forest. That's one of the arguments. So, yeah, thanks. Very good questions. I, um, to be honest, I still need really to, to do the analysis and, I mean, to, to look at more carefully um, the um, spatial distributions of, of these um, shrubs whether they actually occupy a big chunks of area, like in Sumatra they have like quite big areas, or actually it's more scattered or fragmented all over the, the landscapes. Um, yes, but um, I, I don't have, the, I don't have the, the answer right now. Sorry, yeah. Vimika? Um, I'm just referring back to one of the recommendations that you made that, you know, there's all these shrublands, so why not expand on those shrublands, but I'm also finding that recommendation seems to contradict what you've said earlier about how if you were to compare the concessions with the shrubland, you see that actually there's a land bank, which I thought was a very interesting part uh, of what you mentioned, and then also that there are a lot of competing claims. So, you know, while, you know, uh, land might seem idle or might seem, sh you know, just shrubs or degraded, um, there might be an entire story behind that. So I'm wondering if it is possible to also attach caveats to what you've said based on your own analysis, and then to then talk about what else we need to do, like, or what else is already happening at C4 that, that looks at you know, both deforestation in terms of land clearing, but also in terms of land use and how we can complement the two. If, I, don't, I don't know if that made sense, but... <laughs> I can clarify, of course. It's more on, on the comments, I guess. So, um, sure, we are still developing the, the paper. Now, it's still in writing process, so surely I, I will contact you after this, so to find a way to discuss it. But um, thank you, that's, that's, that's a very interesting suggestion, actually. Yeah. Christine? Thanks again. Sorry for, for, it's fine, for this, it's fine. but um, I'm going back to size <laughs> because I think size is sort of key. Um, again, so in, in Nia, so, so I, presumably you're working together, and so it's said that you know nature doesn't take care of it, but of course, nature does take care of small plots that are in mosaic landscapes. So, is this a is this something that um, is important? The fact that we're seeing the big ones, so we have one story. Whereas if we were seeing smaller ones, we'd have another story. You know, also, um, Dayu mentioned people want great big areas. They need big areas for big development, and that's what we classify sort of as getting productive. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to be sort of slightly provocative here, but it's, there's something about, you know, using certain tools that I think do yield a particular story, but don't yield another story, but um, maybe size is something that we do want to focus on, the size of the, of the size of changes and potentially the size of changes back, you know, um, where, where nature at least seems to take care of some things. Thank you, Christine. So um, the, the thing is that um, we use this uh, data at national scale, so national data sets, which was unfortunately, it has a, uh, a, it's a relatively big um, size of the minimum areas can be identified as something. Something could be forest, something could be shrubs, something could be sifting agriculture, and so on. I didn't say that the, the small scale um, um, areas convert to shrubs or sifting cultivation is not important. Of course, it's also important, but due to the limitation of data sets that we have, that we use for the study, we, we cannot really analyze and identify those very detailed um, um, activities um, at, at the very local level. So uh, I, I didn't say that it's not important, it's small scale, but um, yeah. But it's, 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 it's the data that we use and the data that we have, and it's, um, it's apparently it's an official data. Very interesting because um, I don't think that so far no one has, has done it besides for uh, Ministry of Forestry use it for, for national reporting and statistic and um, forestry statistics and so on, but um, the deeper analysis is um, they really rely on us, the um, C4 scientists, to, to work on and to do more analysis uh, applying those data. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay. Any further questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming, and, and thank you, Arif, for, for a very You're interesting welcome. seminar. Um, and uh, let's give Arif a round of applause.